Welcome, everybody, to this edition of Talkback, brought to you by Maverick Motorsports, Western Montana's largest supplier of Yamaha Triumph and used motorcycles, located at 4950 North Reserve. Bulls Eyewear, Missoula's only certified master optician on South Reserve, across from the uh, Larchmont Golf Course, online at bullseyemt.com. Sunway Armory on Stockyard Road, Montana's premier firearms dealer. And by Karis Property Management. If you own rental properties and you're ready to save time, money, and stress, Call Karis Property Management at 543-9798. We got a passel of guests in the studio here this morning. Uh, I'm Peter Christian, of course. Uh, Bob Seidenschwartz joining us. Hello, Bob. <laughs> also joining us this morning. How are you, sir? I am fine. Thank you very much, Peter. Good, good to see you again. Now, would you like to introduce yes, our guest? Course. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, so, good morning, uh, Peter and John. Uh, as you know, this is the beginning of the 15th Annual International Conference on Central and Southwest Asia. And uh, it begins really at noon today, and it goes all the way to Friday afternoon, so two and a half days of exciting panels, wonderful uh, presentations. And uh, we want to really emphasize two of these events, of course, uh, which is this evening, and the two distinguished guests uh, will introduce themselves, but uh, they will uh, have a panel on the whole issue of refugees, immigration, and various presidential uh, uh, statements or executive orders that have been issued from Washington. And uh, one of them is Shahid Hag Hasarat, who is from Helena, and he has represented Shahid, over 1,500 clients. Um, and uh, the other one is our distinguished professor, Anthony Johnston, at, from our law school at the University of Montana. Uh, they will be both speaking this evening. Uh, tomorrow evening, we will have a very distinguished guest, and that is Ambassador John Limbert, uh, who served in Iran, who was the U.S. ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Mauritania. And he, it was in Iran where he taught, and he also served in the embassy, where he was taken hostage. And he was there for 444 days with the rest of the hostages, with the rest of the U.S. hostages there. Um, he's a wonderful speaker. He has been here before. And I want to recognize Bob Seiden Schwartz and all the great work that Montana World Affairs Council has done. Uh, this conference is basically co-sponsored between the Central Southwest Asian Studies Center and the Montana World Affairs Council. So today at noon, we started with a panel of students sharing their uh, research, and then we will go to an afternoon panel. Shahid will be in that panel too. Uh, she, he will be joined by two women from Afghanistan and Iran who will speak about their stories and their uh, harrowing experiences as uh, refugees also. So there's quite a bit that is happening, but I want to now ask Shahid and Anthony to say a few words about themselves. This is the way the listeners will get to know them a little bit, and of course, then we will open it up for questions yeah. from callers. Shahid, please. Um, well, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for inviting me to join the panel. Um, I've been living in Montana for about 10 years now, and um, shortly after I came here, I started my own practice, uh, in, in immigration practice, to represent uh, clients who are facing deportation or people who are applying for green cards or citizenship. And it's been um, really a, it, it's been an, an incredible pleasure to represent so many people and help them um, live here in our state. And uh, Montana is a unique state uh, for a lot of reasons. And um, people come here for a lot, of, a lot of reasons, a lot of them the same reasons that um, bring everybody to Montana. It's a beautiful place to live. There's, um, it's a safe place. You have an occasional sunny live. day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> it's unique in that way. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, the cold doesn't keep too many people away. But um, you know, it, it, Montana is uh, is an interesting place because it's one of the places with the least numbers of non-citizens in the entire country. So. I think we're tied with uh, North Dakota and Wyoming for the least numbers of non-citizens in the entire country. 
But at the same time, we still have our fair share of people who are applying for asylum. Um, we have uh, a large number of Canadian visitors, um, people who are from Mexico or Central America and from every country all throughout um, the world. So um, it's, it's been, um, that's been what I've de dedicated my career to doing, um, helping people who are um, undocumented to, to stay here with their families and keep them together. And, um, and uh, uh, that's, that's what I do. Okay. I, I'm curious real quick, why do you think Montana and North Dakota sit in that range of having some of the fewest numbers of, of immigrants into the state. And along with that, why did you locate in Montana, if that's the case? Yeah, well, I came here uh, 10 years ago. Um, you know, I moved here with um, my, my spouse. She went to the University of Montana. And so that kind of, that's what brought us here 10 years ago. But um, in and terms you of- said, You said where? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah. I, I went to law school in Chicago and it was a big, big change. Oh, yeah. But um, I, don't, I don't regret it at all. I like it here a lot. I, um, um, I couldn't imagine living anywhere else now that I've been here for 10 years. I think it's great. It's um, one of those places where you can make a difference as, as one person. You can actually um, try to influence policy, try to shape things, and you can actually make a difference here, whereas in a lot of states, you know, you're just one drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the things I like. And before we move to Anthony, and Anthony, I would appreciate you also saying a few words about yourself. I wanted to also the listeners to know that Shahid has received a very distinguished award from Governor Bullock. Shahid, could you say a few words about that? Oh, it wasn't. I know from I'm causing uh, causing an embarrassment, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the greatest prize, I assume, is being on Talkback. I mean, to be invited to oh, this yeah. program, <laughs> it's an honor. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a real honor. But no, I don't want. So this um, was the this was the. Um, well, it was the ACLU. The ACLU. Um, they that gave was, me um, yeah. an award. It's called yeah. the Jeanette Rankin the Jeanette. Award after um, the first female uh, senator, and and um, that and was. When uh, did you receive it, Sean? Oh, that was in January. January. Yeah. So very recent, yeah. basically. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, that was a that was a big big honor. So <laughs> you, you get dragged to Montana by a girl from Montana, and you get the first female senator <laughs> award. Right. So well, what's the award for, actually? Well, it's the Jeanette Rankin Peace Award. Uh, it, it's, I guess, for um, some for people who kind of make a difference in the area of civil rights, and I guess they, gotcha. for whatever reason, just, thought that. Just so you know, she's the first me. female congresswoman. Oh well, <laughs> sorry. Come on. Now. I mean, okay. We got, we... Well, I might have to give back the award now. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't know. I mean, anyway. So Anthony, so let, let's talk about. Let's talk to you for a moment. Um, well, Peter and John, it's great to be back, uh, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to participate in this important international conference, and I'm looking forward to my discussion with Shahid tonight and Bob about um, some of the issues uh, surrounding immigration, um, uh, historically as well as uh, currently under, under President Trump. Um, my contribution today, as usual, is kind of a big picture. Uh, I teach constitutional law and legislation at the University of Montana Blewett School of Law. And uh, I look forward to trying to put some of these policy debates, which have been going on since the beginning of our republic, uh, into more perspective. Um, because th these issues are in our courts. These constitutional claims are being litigated. And so what I hope to be able to provide and add to the discussion is um, some of what um, uh, Shahid and his clients and uh, what uh, the rest of us here in Montana uh, might expect as these debates play out under our Constitution. Okay, with that, we're going to take our first break. We have four lines open. If you'd like to visit with our distinguished guests, give us a call, 721-1290. We'll be here for an hour and a half uh, talking about all sorts of things uh, related to the conference and, of course, these fine gentlemen here. Uh, but we'd love to have you be a part of the conversation. 721-1290 is our number. We will be right back. We're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. And joining us in the studio, of course, we've uh, we talked with Mirdad Kia, Shahid Haq Hazrath. Got it right? Thank you. And uh, uh, he's an attorney with a border crossing firm. And we're also, of course, Anthony Johnstone joining us. John King, I'm Peter Christian, and that's all the time we have. That's so. uh, we're out of uh, we're out of time. Thanks for all the names, guys, and some fun weather jokes. Thank you, Peter, thank, for thank that. Any time. Uh, yeah. Well, let's actually uh, crunch down into one of the big topics that everybody has been talking about since the election, and that's the impact 
of the new executive in the president's office and immigration policy. Uh, you know, we've seen this bounced around, whether it's in courts in Washington or Hawaii or elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of disagreement between some in the judicial branch and some in the executive branch over where exactly immigration powers lie and where we might cross those lines. And I'd just like to get a little bit of a description maybe from Anthony of what's trans, um, what's happened over the last couple months and then get some feedback on what your two thoughts are on whether or not immigration policy in uh, the United States is heading in a good direction or a bad direction maybe. Sure. The, um, uh, the first executive order that President Trump issued on the um, particular question involving immigrant travel uh, came out in January 27th. Um, he's also issued other orders regarding um, funding for cities and just issued an order with respect to work visas. But uh, the, the real focus in, in controversy uh, so far has been around uh, the January 27th order um, in which the president uh, claimed powers under uh, his Article II powers as president, the executive power, as well as an act passed by Congress that allows the president to identify classes of aliens detrimental to the interests of the United States and suspend their entry. Exercising that power, um, he attempted to impose a 90-day suspension of entry for individuals from seven uh, predominantly uh, Muslim countries uh, in, the, in the Near East, um, as well as suspending uh, refugee admissions and, uh, and uh, banning Syrian refugees. Uh, the state of Washington, along with many other groups, uh, challenged that executive order in federal court in Washington, and um, uh, a couple courts actually um, uh, uh, found that the law was unconstitutional. The state of Washington uh, case went up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the same circuit court that we're in in Montana, and this federal court upheld uh, that order um, declaring that law unconstitutional. Um, it was unconstitutional. They focused on, on several different uh, issues uh, under, under the law, but probably that first order's main problems were, um, its biggest problems were its impacts on uh, permanent residents, lawful permanent residents, as well as visa holders um, who had already been given permission and therefore had constitutional rights um, under uh, uh, American law. Um, in, while the uh, Trump administration um, continues to uh, litigate that case in the lower courts in Washington, um, uh, President Trump issued a revised order in March uh, that changed, uh, fixed several of the biggest problems of that order, including its applicability to people lawfully resident in the United States, lawful permanent residents, as well as visa card holders who had an entitlement from the United States to come to the country. Uh, they also uh, scaled back slightly uh, the ban on uh, immigration uh, from uh, now not uh, seven countries, um, but they pulled Iraq out of that group. So real quick, when you look at the Artic Article 2 powers granted to the, uh, the president, where did he cross the line exactly? Uh, I mean, visa holders, all these exceptions that are made by the court, the Ninth Circuit Court, I mean, where do they find them in the Constitution? Right. Well, constitutional law is a, is a two-step dance. Um, whenever the federal government wants to do something to you, they need to claim both a power um, and they need to respect your rights. Uh, the question of whether uh, the president has the power to do this, um, the president claims presidential power, uh, and that's been debated over a long time, ever since uh, Congress passed the uh, Alien Friends and Enemies Act in 1798, and John Adams uh, took on his political enemies, trying to throw him out of the country. Um, it's been debated ever since. Madison and Jefferson at the time said that was obviously unconstitutional. Uh, they knew something about the Constitution. And ever well, they since. Wrote it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, J Jefferson was in, yeah. Mitt was in France for part of it. But um, that debate over whether the president alone has the power has been one of the debates. And then there's a separate question about just what powers Congress has, which interestingly, although for the past century, Congress has uh, controlled migration um, quite aggressively, um, for the first uh, century, uh, really the states and re not the national government maintained control over migration. So there are two powers questions. Does the president have the power 
and and does or does the Congress have the power to give the president? And that's before we even get to questions of religious liberties, equal protection, etc. So, Anthony or Shahid, either of you or both of you, if you could comment on this. So, you, the first executive order included uh, the so-called green green card holders, right? Which is permanent residents. Now, why? Because permanent residents go through quite a bit of uh, process. Mm-hmm. from fingerprinting to interviews and so on and so forth. Was it just the oversight or just a mistake? Or or was it just because it was written so fast that nobody actually checked it? What was it? Because it created the biggest confusion within that first executive order. It did. There are differences of opinion on whether it was a strategic decision to instill fear um, and um, shake things up and make... Uh, make everybody realize that um, the administration was taking a different course or whether it was an accident or oversight. And I don't think anyone really knows for sure, but uh, there have been plenty of reasons to think that it was actually deliberate. So um, the, the, by taking away the rights of permanent residents, these are people who are green card holders, they can't vote, but in every other respect, they're allowed to freely enter the country and live here. By, by taking away their right to enter and actually... It, this executive order, I should clarify, you know, just to, just to kind of s- explain what this really meant. It meant that everybody, everybody from, uh, from these seven countries was banned from entering the country. I mean, that's a pretty wide net by any measure. I mean, y- y- you would think that um, you would narrowly tailor your concerns to some specific subset of people you're concerned about. But now, this was there everyone. Were, there was the possibility of the government carving out exceptions, correct? Well, um, th- I think they discussed that a little bit more with the second executive order, um, allowing for some waivers. But even in the first, there was a carve out or a exception ability by the U.S. government. Well, you know, it's kind of when you um, when you cast the when when you set the priorities and you establish what the rule is, and you provide a little escape clause, sure. that's rarely going to be used by the average adjudicator. But it was there. It was it was supposedly there. But you know, one interesting thing about that executive order is that. Um, it talked about banning for 90 days the admission of, of people and uh, the admission of refugees for 90 days. Um, but when the revised order, executive order, came down, um, you know, almost two months later, uh, it again imposed a 90-day ban. So there's good reason to think this 90 days isn't really 90 days. It's basically intended to be more or less indefinite. Okay, we're going to come right back. We're up against a break. Uh, all, again, all four lines are open. Fascinating conversation. Love to be a part of it. 721-1290. We'll be right back. And hey, we're back on TalkBack, 721-1290 is our number. The Montana World Affairs Council on the radio in the middle of talking about the uh, the recently uh, struck down ban on immigration. So go ahead, John. Yeah, we were, yeah, we were talking a little bit about uh, Trump and immigration, but I wanted to step a little bit closer to home real quick and talk about Montana and immigration and uh, refugees, things like that. And obviously this is a lot of your work directly, Shahid, right? Right. And so what has that experience been like in Montana? I mean, we see different scenarios play out in like big cities like California or, you know, in California or in Washington. But in Montana, it's probably a little bit of a different tenor. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, when the, um, the travel ban was first implemented, there were protests at airports all throughout the country. People were flooding JFK and other airports. And um, we didn't see that quite as much here because we don't really have that many international airports. And the people who were initially caught up in this travel ban were people who were already on an airplane when the executive order was issued. And a lot of them were detained and they had no reason to believe that they were even in trouble at the time they boarded the plane. So we, we kind of missed um, that particular controversy and that particular you know, um, thing. But, you know, we, um, we, do have, we do have visitors from these seven countries who are, who are banned. We have a lot of students who are... Um, attending universities in Montana because yeah. I called UM asking for students and the, the the heads weren't able to tell me anybody that was directly affected. Well, I can tell you at least uh, one case that Shahid and I were talking about a very distinguished, in fact, young scholar uh, at, at the university, um, Iranian citizens. Uh, the wife had to go back uh, in order to visit an ailing mother and was reassured that she could come back because she had a legitimate visa. And they're both at the university here. And then when she went back to 
reconfirm or actually receive the visa, she was told that because of the ban, she could not come. Oh, wow. So we had to <clears throat> call and contact and so on and so forth. And I'm happy to report that uh, she received it. But these kinds of headaches did were created. Did she get the special exemption then? Well, we, we have 10 seconds. I'm sorry. We yes. Have ten, yeah, well, she did get the exemption. Okay, we're going to come back. Stay with us. We have a whole other hour to discuss all this, and we will be right back. Welcome back to Talk Back, brought to you by Maverick Motorsports, Bulls Eyewear, Selway Armory, and Karis Property Management. We're back. The Montana World Affairs Council on the radio joining us uh, in, in the studio this morning. Shahid Hansroth is an attorney uh, helping people with immigration problems. Uh, uh, Anthony Johnstone, law professor at the University of Montana. History professor Mirdad Kia, John King, Peter Christian. Uh, Mirdad, during the break... You told me something that, that really helped clarify some things for me, just on a general level. Uh, uh, folks with, who have had green cards for more than five years uh, can become American citizens almost instantaneously, or, or it's very little. But there's a reason why they don't. So uh, would you please explain that? Especially from the countries that have been designated, the, the first seven and now six without Iraq. A lot of people, I, I think some people, you know, some of your listeners might ask, why are they not applying for citizenship if they have had a green card for five years. The reason is, and I know actually individuals who need to go back to some of these countries. And if the government of that country finds out that they have become U.S. citizens, they might lose their property. You know, they might have their buildings or they might be renting a building. where That might be expropriated. I'm in this case, I can talk about the Islamic Republic of Iran, right? U.S. citizens, even though you have been born and raised and you were a green card holder and you had an Iranian passport, you will run into a problem if they find out that you are a U.S. citizen. That's why they keep the green card, so they can go back, take care of property, take care of family issues. Otherwise, practically, they are U.S. citizens and they can become very quickly. The reason they keep the green card option is because they can travel easier into that country and leave it there. Now, Miradad, are those fears justified? Is that stuff that the government actively does? Uh, do you have friends that have had this happen to them? Well, sort of thing? just the number of Iranians who actually dropped the green card, received their citizenship, and went back to Iran, a country which does not have a U.S. embassy, but we operate through the Swiss interest section in Tehran, right? So the... Who is representing me? Who is protecting me? And the Iranian government, knowing that there is no protection or there is no legal presence in the country, how many Iranian-born U.S. citizens have landed in jail or have been detained or are waiting to be released because there is no U.S. authority and United States does not have a regular and normal relationship with mm. Iran? So, yes, it is a risk to go back with an American passport to Iran. Wow. Um, let, let's chat a little bit with Shahid about uh, refugees and obviously the uh, terror and craziness of, of stuff going on in Syria has changed the refugee template for most of the world right now, especially in Europe. But we over here in the United States kind of watch some of the horror stories that play out. And a lot of people are really scared to see uh, an influx of, of a massive influx of refugees. And I guess does that hit home for you? Do you see that? And what would you tell people that, that think that way? Well, there are people in Montana who are afraid of refugees. There's no doubt about that. It's something that um, was part of the last governor, gubernatorial election. It um, has been, you know, fears about refugees have been, um, you know, those fears have been fanned and for political reasons. And so, yeah, but, it, you know, I, I don't think it's a legitimate fear um, at all. And I, I think it's kind of unfortunate that just because Montana, um, you know, in Missoula, we just recently, um, we didn't, I mean, I didn't have anything to do with that, but the, the refugee resettlement office opened and we have had some families come in and, um, you know, I, there has, there was some pushback, there were some concerns about um, refugee placement and um, there's a housing shortage in Missoula, the cost of um, housing is kind of high and so kind of high yeah i mean it, it says the guy from helena right and you know i can see some concerns about the fact that 
uh, Missoula would be bringing in refugees, but then some of them might not end up living here. I, I can understand that. But at the same time, um, I think the idea that these refugees would cause any harm to our communities is really just based out of, um, it's just, it's fear. It, it's, um, it's not true. And what I've noticed is that the more Montanans actually meet them face to face, they quickly realize that their fears were misplaced. Well, strap your headphones on because we, we, have, we have a caller and I uh, like to put our callers on uh, with our guests when they take the time to call. So let's, uh, let's talk with Candy. Candy, you're on with our guests. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes, I think the adoption of this uh, concept of a living constitution has perverted these people's ideas because the constitution is the supreme law of the land and with and if the president is acting upon the supreme law of the land he has every right to protect the people of america and for these people are um, saying how bad it is and they can't go back to whatever country because they are an American citizen. They need to take stock of where they want to, to be and not be ashamed of being an American citizen. So I think the perversion of this living constitution is one of the reasons why the University of Montana does not attract a lot of people to it because it's so liberal. And I'm furious at this conversation that these people would take this stand against our uh, so president. So real, real quick, Candy, and what, did, uh, what did they say about a living constitution? that They don't have to say it. Because it's already... So you're just uh, attacking them for something you presume that they believe? Yes, because they're perverting the supreme law of the land to fit their situation. So they have some legal uh, justification for something that isn't legal at the heart of it. And these people... If they come to America and they don't want to be a citizen, then they should not be here because the law is the law. And the Constitution that these people swear to, and I know attorneys swear to it too, to uphold it, they are arguing it in a fashion that says that it's not firm. Well, uh, Candy, you say the law is the law, but the law provides for people to come to the United States that are not citizens and to live here under a bunch of different statuses. Yes, and that's and that's with, the law. That's with our blessing that they do that. And if they don't want to be a citizen, and they don't want the, this whole thing with. Uh, not saying you're a citizen because you have property in a, a different country. What does that? You, you have to draw the line somewhere. Right. Yeah. And these people are here we, by we also, our good grace. We also have to draw the line and go to a commercial yeah. break. Okay, Candy, Candy thanks I'm for sorry. your call. Th thanks for the call. Okay, we got the gist of what you're talking about. We'll address that when we come back. I, I think everybody wants to jump in on this. <laughs> seven to one. I think seven to one twelve ninety is our number. We have all four lines open. If you'd like to get on the conversation this is open to everyone so give us a call we'll be right back talk back rolling right along beautiful morning out there got a great conversation going this morning guests in the studio and uh, so anthony you wanted to uh, to tackle uh, the things that uh, candy was discussing sure um you know i guess i'd tell candy that i uh we strive to uh, be entirely faithful to the Constitution. And I think because this is such a complicated question with a lot of history, I think it makes sense to let's, let's open up the Constitution and see what it says. Actually, let's start before the Constitution. So the Declaration of Independence, one of the complaints that the colonists had against the king 
was, he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither. In other words, one of the purposes of the American Revolution was um, to revolt against the king's refusal to allow immigration. When you get into the Constitution, I think the text is important. The text is the law. The text binds us. The problem um, with uh, vague generalizations about what the Constitution means is uh, it ignores the text. And there are real debates and questions around this. There is no enumerated power over immigration in the Constitution. There's an enumerated power over commerce with foreign nations. There's an enumerated power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization to create citizens, but that's different from immigration. In fact, the only thing the original Constitution, the only thing the Constitution currently has ever said about immigration and migration was a uh, dreaded provision that limited Congress's ability to import slaves. That's the only thing the Constitution says expressly about immigration. So then we need to look at history. And these are important debates, but I, again, I think it's worth noting that um, when President Adams signed a law um, giving him full power to expel uh, immigrants um, under the Alien Acts of 1798, Jefferson, on behalf of the people of Kentucky, wrote that um, the alien friends are under the jurisdiction and protection of the laws of the states and that there's no power over them in the United States. Madison also complained about that. Now, a lot has happened since then, but as, as far as I can tell um, with respect to Candy, I haven't taken us past 1800. Um, we're dealing with original meanings here. Uh, where it gets complicated is what's happened since. And I'll, I'll finally say one of the things that James Madison, the father of the Constitution, said in the Virginia Resolution, one of his complaints about these acts giving the president the power to expel immigrants. Um, he said, banishment of an alien from a country into which he has been invited as the asylum most auspicious to his happiness, right, where he enjoys a greater share of the blessings of personal security and personal liberty than he can elsewhere hope for. If he be exposed to the peculiar casualties incident to a crisis of war, and possibly to vindictive purposes, which his immigration itself may have provoked. In other words, if he is a refugee, if a banishment of this sort be not among the severest of punishments, it will be difficult to imagine a doom to which the name be applied. That's James Madison, the father of our Constitution. I, I think, though, when we, when we look at the Constitution and uh, you know, we consider the way that people were viewed at that time, you know, like one individual coming over to the United States wouldn't probably pose a threat there's unlikely going to be any kind of dramatic horror produced by one individual in 1776. However, we now know in, in a modern age with modern technology, one individual can produce a great amount of horror, two or three interviews, individuals even greater. Um, and when it comes to terror networks like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, when these groups work together and get somebody into a country, they can wreak all kind of havoc, whether that's a bombing in Madrid or a tower in New York. And a lot of people are afraid that acts of war will be carried out by individuals in such a way. And so that's what requires an extra level of scrutiny when it comes to getting into the United States. How should we, if we if, how, in, this, in light of this, how should we make sure that we keep our population safe, but at the same time are fair to visitors who want to gain entrance? Yeah, I, I'll turn to Shahid on, on this uh, briefly, but that's, that's exactly the question. It's not susceptible to an easy recourse to questions of a living constitution or originalism. These, these are questions that we have to decide together as a nation, recognizing the limited powers of the federal government and uh, the constitutional rights that all persons, not just citizens, but persons possess uh, under our 14th Amendment and other areas. So, you know, on the issue of security and making sure that the people who come into our country pose no risk, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because there are already security screenings that take place. They have been taking place. Um, when I help people with asylum, uh, they're they're vetted very uh, carefully. There are, there are all kinds of FBI background checks and uh, that are done. Sometimes holding up the applications for over a year just to conduct those security checks. So. Um, 
the idea that it ha- is not being done is just m- more more fear. It, but I, you know, the one thing I wanted to just um, a- a- make clear is that despite the fact that some people may not choose to apply for citizenship for for property reasons and others, the vast majority of the clients that I've represented want to apply for citizenship the minute they are eligible. The day they are eligible, we apply for citizenship for them. So that's by far the more common scenario. And although the FBI might look at someone for a long time, it doesn't guarantee that they have you know, any future sight as to how that person's going to act. I mean, we now know they followed Omar Mateen for quite a while before <laughs> the, the terror pulse bombing so, I mean, or a shooting, I what should they, say. What it comes down to is this. Um, do we think there's a way that we can um, more narrowly determine who poses a risk than just banning everyone from an entire country? I mean, do we really think we have to just go ahead and say, let's ban an entire country? Or are we smart enough and capable enough of, or, of more narrowly tailoring what our risks are? I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Go ahead, no, no, no. And, break, but, so. but, but the point that John is uh, bringing up, it's not new and it's not confined to the countries that are listed. I mean, from a little bit of history, and Anthony, I want you to comment on that. For example, the whole issue of Irish immigrants coming to this country, connection with IRA, revolutionary activities, gun running, so on and so So, I mean, this is not a new sort of phenomenon. It has been there as a security issue and at that point, we didn't put a huge net and say everybody from Ireland is a, is a threat. We knew that certain individuals. And I think in this case, too, I think we have to look at individual cases and vet them very carefully, but not have a blanket policy, uh, which includes an entire people. Okay. We're going to come right back. 721-1290 is our number. Mary, John, and Marilyn all waiting to visit. We also have one line open. And that everybody's sounds like got a folk band. Yeah, yes. Mary, John, and Marilyn. <laughs> we'll, we'll be right back. I knew when I said that. Uh, if you only heard what goes on during the breaks, 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-530. Now, we want to be faithful to our callers. We'll get as many in as we can. Uh, about about 35 minutes left in the program. Mary, you are up first. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a quick comment. I have two in-laws, a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law, who have probably been in this country for, uh, have green cards, and have been here for probably at least 30 years, both of which have the green cards because they want to go back to Singapore or Mexico, uh, one or the other, and they bring their children with them to visit the grand, their, their family members. That's just wanted to comment on that. They are fine citizens here. Otherwise, they're not legal. They're not citizens, but they are. Their children, of course, are, and they're fine. Uh, have given good contributions to this country. Okay. Well, thanks, just, thanks, a, just a comment. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate that. Just real quick, because uh, people are throwing words out there that might everyone might not understand. Like, obviously, there's something called a citizen, and there's someone uh, that holds a green card. There's just visitors. There's student visas. Like, how many different types of thing can you be <laughs> and be in America? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll actually make it pretty quick since I don't want to take up everybody's time and bore everybody. But so, basically, there are, there are visas that are just temporary in duration, and there are just a wide variety of them and it's like an alphabet soup because they're literally like the b visa f visa h visa these are work visas or visitors visas now a visa basically says you can use this credit card anywhere you want to go right absolutely is that what it means accepted everywhere Um, (laughs) it it basically it gives you permit to come to the united states and it grants you some protections above and beyond what uh someone that might come into the country without a visa might receive is that correct yeah the duration and status right is Different, right? F one is student visa, for example. Right. But B right. is business. Yeah, the so, thing that yeah. makes um, the, the thing that all of these like student visas or work visas, they're all similar in the sense that um, they are temporary, and you you um, they don't mean that you get to live here forever. Um, so those visas you apply for um, at at the consulates in different countries and um, see if you get them, and they have different criteria, but. Those are very different from green cards. So green card, there are limited ways to get a green card. Usually family-based petitions will get you a green card. There are some limited work-based petitions that can get you a green card, but you have to prove that there's no qualified U.S. worker to take the job, and you have to advertise and recruit, and and the visas are limited um, that way. So it's hard to get your green card unless you have a family member who's a U.S. citizen. Mm. 
um, an immediate family member. And this is spouse. better than a visa. Um, I mean, uh, so as far as your card, status recognition yeah, by the a, government. A green card means that you get to reside here permanently. You can freely enter and exit. You cannot leave the country for more than six months in one trip. Otherwise, you abandon it. It's really meant for people who live here as their permanent residents. And you can't vote. You can't get public benefits like welfare. But otherwise, you get to live here. And then after you've had your green card for um, five years in most cases, then you can apply for citizenship. And you have to apply. You don't just automatically get it. And um, you have to pass a civics test, an English test, and pay an application fee. So, so you can't just show up with an American flag tattoo and an eagle on your back. You actually have to go through a five-year process of green card. I mean, it helps to have the tattoo, but <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's get back, let's get back to the phones. Uh, John, you are on with our guests. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'd like to draw a, a quick analogy here. If, if a, a husband and wife are arguing... Um, and, and if that were the government of a household versus a country, then th would that be the time to invite guests over? <laughs> Probably not. It's not that normally that home is not a home that has the character of being inviting to guests or that it never will be again. It's just at this time, this is not a good time. What does so, the, what, in the analogy, who are the, uh, the, the, the parents here? Who are the husband and wife? Um, the conservatives versus the Democrats. Uh, wouldn't that be wouldn't it be an uninviting time? Versus the communists. Look, I, I would just say this: if our whole history, though. I mean, our whole the history Trumpers is versus the the uh, Obamites. So, if you're if a husband and wife are arguing inside a home, and there's somebody starving outside, somebody who is freezing to death, and you don't open the door for them, yeah, I'd say there's okay, a little bit of well, a problem. There. Okay, well, if uh, one of the if if the husband or wife lets them in, uh, that person's going to be caught in a crossfire. So the husband and wife better uh, settle down and invite them in uh, so they don't starve. But I don't think that anybody's starving out there right so, now. In fact, we have way too many fat people that were uninvited <laughs> that came in. Hey, anyway, John, John, just real quick, just real quick question for you, to, just along your analogy, because I think I it's interesting. That's where I'm going. Okay, with, with, with the husband and wife, though, I mean, if you look back historically, I mean, whether it's Jefferson or Adams or... Uh, you know, all the different debates. I mean, there's always been two sides in this democracy that have disagreed over things. So you would never really have a time when you would right. ever have anybody come over. Exactly. Uh, uh, I, will, I will point out in the original response to Candy's remarks earlier that uh, the guest referred to the Constitution and immigration. I find it odd that he went to immigration when that is not what the argument is about. Legal immigration is not what the argument is about. The American citizens are fed up with people coming in here illegally, making a home, and then having no loyalty toward this country. We are at a time now where the country is being co-opted in its very roots as to what the meaning of the Constitution and freedom is, and there's a huge debate going on. And right. starting a country was what the immigration was about at that time. We did need to have people in here to build a country. At this time, we we're overflowing with people with lots of creative ideas, with lots of uh, different perspectives, and we need to get this worked out okay. inside our country first before we invite anybody else in. What the identity of America is, what, our, uh, what the, uh, the Constitution is, and go forward from there. All right, John, we got to take a break. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Marilyn and Eric and Eli are going to be coming up in a moment. And I, I'm sure our guests would like to uh, respond to what right. we just said. And so. actually, a new t we haven't really talked about illegal immigration, but I think that is a major concern. Oh, aside from the terror issue, this, uh, the, the issue of illegal immigration is at the top of the minds of many Americans. So right. I'd hope you can respond to that as well. We're gonna, to. Yeah, we're going to come right back, so stay with us. Hey, thanks for joining us on Talkback. Uh, we just had a very interesting call from John, and I know that all of all of our folks here in the studio want to comment on that. Illegal so. immigration. So I know some people don't even like using the term. Uh, I, so I just want to get your your take on when it the, the the status of illegal immigration in the United States. This is someone I think in the general understanding is someone that comes into the United States without oversight by the government at all. No visa, no green card. They sneak in and um, one way or the other try to set up life here. I, I just want to say, but, but John is, is giving voice to uh, a historic age-old argument about immigration and the question of national identity. Um, I left off in 1800. You know, by, by the 19th century, as immigration increased, even in Montana, um, the Bute labor unions opposed uh, the immigration of Chinese who were uh, 
uh, Chinese laborers who were building the mines and, and the railroads. And Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was really the first time the federal government had, had ever excluded an entire group of people. And these were very much the same arguments. So I think, I think I'd tell John that these arguments aren't new. This is part of our tradition and a debate about national identity and how welcoming we want to be as a national household. So when it comes to illegal, and you're, you're an attorney that represents... Yeah, I represent all kinds of... Do you represent who, anybody that uh, would be deemed an illegal alien? Well, so illegal immigration, I don't have a problem with. Illegal alien is a little bit of a weird term. I'll just briefly say why. I mean, alien okay. just means non-citizen. So an alien is somebody who's not a citizen. Okay. And um, you wouldn't really say somebody's an illegal citizen. doesn't really make sense. And so I don't think illegal non-citizen or illegal alien really makes sense. It's... Same you can be illegal, person. but it makes sense to be a legal non-citizen. Um, I was a legal non-citizen of Japan for three years. I had everything on above board with the government of Japan and with the United States. I was legal. Were, if were I were you there, legal or was your status legal? My I mean, status if, was legal. If, well, if I hadn't had it above board, then I would be illegal. And I wouldn't have had a problem if they called me an illegal alien. Well, I don't it makes think sense. people are illegal. That's Eli Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Holocaust survivor. He, he's the one who coined the term. Um, you know, he's the one who said the phrase, no human being is illegal. So that's, that's where that comes from. But anyway, that, that's a side point. But yeah, there, so people who, who people would say are undocumented, unauthorized aliens, whatever, whatever term you want to use, they are in a wide variety of categories. Not all of them entered the country by crossing the border illegally. Some of them came in with valid visas and just overstayed those, and they are still in the same boat as people who entered the country illegally in terms of the fact that they just don't have valid immigration status. But yeah, I represent a lot of people who entered the country um, without inspection, just crossing the border, um, it, it, the southern border, or even the northern border without um, any kind of valid documents or inspection, just entering illegally. And sometimes there are options for them, uh, despite the fact that they entered illegally. Sometimes there are not. So it really depends. Um, but you know, one thing about it, that using the term illegal, that it, that's a little bit, um, you know, gives, gives the wrong characterization is that people think that it's a crime to enter the country illegally or it's a crime to be here after having entered the country illegally. But in, in fact, it's a civil infraction. It's a misdemeanor, right? Well, it's, it's so a... the act, if you are caught in the act of entering the country illegally, literally caught while you're entering, mm. that's a misdemeanor, but nobody's ever charged with that. Um, once you're here, once you've already entered the country, it's no longer a crime of any kind. It's not a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. If you entered the country illegally and you're here now, nobody can arrest you for a, a crime. It, you could be arrested for a crime. It is a felony to illegally re-enter after being deported. So if you're deported and you re-enter again, that is a crime. It seems like we're designing laws just to make it harder I, on ourselves. I, it's I, complicated. I do not understand this at all. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the dumb, I'm the least educated man in this room. Seriously, I really am. So what I hear you saying is that, let, let, let's say my, my name is, is Roberto, and I come, I'm, I'm sitting on the border of Texas, and nobody's looking, and I, I run across through the, through the Rio Grande, I come across into Texas, and I've crossed the border illegally, mm -hmm. okay? So I am now an illegal alien in the United States, but I have, now that I'm here and my, and my feet are on U.S. soil, I'm not committing any crime. Well, is that you're what you're not committing saying? an ongoing criminal okay. violation. All right. you know? I mean, you could be arrested and it be and placed into deportation proceedings. Those are considered civil proceedings. But what would they like arrest the you for? Real quick, because you said that no crimes were there. So what would they possibly arrest you for under your understanding? So it, this is, um, I'm not the one making this up. This is, our, <laughs> this is the immigration system of the United States. Okay. So it, it, they're being um, charged administratively. They're, putting it, they're put into an administrative proceeding. Just like the IRS could arrest you for not paying your taxes, um, the Department of Homeland Security can arrest you for being here without valid immigration status. And that arrest is not considered a criminal violation. It's just um, you're being taken into custody. The Supreme Court has held that it's not considered punishment or anything like that. It's just an administrative procedure. So is the term illegal uh, immigrant even valid? I mean, w w once they're there, they're not illegal anymore. Am, am I right? I mean... It, <laughs> I don't. I don't have a particular dog in the fight of whether sure. you, you say um, illegal immigrant or not. Right. But um, right. it, but I do care about it being presented. If people say it's a crime and it's not, then that's just not accurate. All right.
And with that, I'm so I'm so sorry uh, to our callers. We just got so wrapped up in this. We're up against another break. So now we have Marilyn, Eric, Eli, and Jim, and Roberto now, and Roberto <laughs> exactly. So I, yeah, we got a better name, but better I could've accent could've been, preferred. It could have been could have been Pedro, which I is mean, which I would be me. Geraldo, but <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be right back. <laughs> All righty then, 721-1290 is the number. It's talk back. All four lines are full, so we're going to get right to the phones. And uh, Marilyn has been waiting the longest. Thank you for your patience, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, so um, John's call was really good. This discussion has been really good. But uh, once again, it's propaganda. Um, Shahid, a red flag right away with me, uh, Shahid or whatever, Um Okay, he came here from Chicago, and it's hard to make a difference in Chicago because you're just one little person. But you come to Montana, you can shape policy and make a difference. And isn't that why Californians come here and, and other people? I fled Washington because it became a socialist state. And, uh, you know, other people flee California because they don't like the socialist state it has become. So um, we have legitimate fears. People are getting their heads chopped off. People are getting blown up. The Constitution is not a suicide pact. We have a right to protect our borders. Um, so when Candy called in, I was hoping she was going to mention what she told me about happened in the Missoula City Council on Monday night. I hope she'll call back and give some of those details. Well, what happened? The lines are full. They declared Islam Week next week. And she's going to send me a copy of the flyer, brochure, or whatever the hell it is. Anyways, they've declared a caliphate on the world. The Missoula Council of, did that, huh? The pl- there's plenty of info. No, the Islamists. There's plenty of information out there that show that they've been infiltrating our country and other countries. They're ru- they've ruined Europe now, so we're going to let them ruin America, too? I mean, enough with it. And they are getting welfare. They are getting ballots, even though they're not citizens. Obama let hundreds of thousands of them in to take over red states and turn them into blue states. So, Marilyn, real quick, real quick, do you think that everybody that uh, claims to be Muslim or uh, adopts Islam as their faith would fall under this category of, or should fall under a category of, of a ban or of a exemption of from the United not, States. But how many times do we have to say it's part of their caliphate and their religion to lie about who they are and come in here and do their caliphate, take well, us over? Why, why do you say, of course us. not? You say, of course not, but then you say them and they like it's every They're single not one. Being ex- Donald Trump wants to extremely vet them. Obama wasn't vetting them decently. There was that woman that came in as the fiancé on a fiancé visit visa to San Bernardino. Mm. They didn't vet her. She got with her husband, and they killed 14 people down there. I mean, how many, how many times does that have to happen before our country wakes up? And I think they are waking up. That's why Donald Trump got elected. Okay, well, Marilyn, we're, we're going to we got lots of other folks. Okay. We pre- appreciate your call. Okay, gentlemen, so, so go ahead. Yeah, let, let me comment. Let me just um, answer some of that. So, uh, to be honest, there wasn't really almost anything Marilyn said that was true. So I'll just start off with that. But um, so, so look, I uh, my parents came to this country some forty five years ago from from Pakistan. My dad's a doctor. You know, he came to serve in a rural, underserved community back then. There were some visas for doing that. And in Chicago, it, no, it started off in Georgia. I was born oh, in Georgia. Okay, gotcha. So you know, I I was born here. I'm a U.S. citizen, but. Um, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't necessarily know that from the way I look. Um, you know, hopefully from the way I talk, you you can get that. But well, you sound like a southerner. Yeah, I can, yeah, I yeah. I grew up in the Midwest. <laughs> I, um, I grew, How y'all doing? Yeah. I mainly grew up in Indiana, so I'm glad you guys could detect that. But um, but you know, it, all my life I've been plagued by people who assume a lot of things about me. You know, they they assume that. Um, because of my name or how I look or the fact that I have a beard, um, that I must be some fundamentalist um, Muslim person. And, you know, these types of assumptions are just wrong. I mean, it, it, every time, um, every time I'm, I'm, I'm in the news to, about one of my cases or providing comment on something, the, the comment threads are all about, why don't you check this guy? He must be a, a Muslim extremist and everything. And I think, you know, the, 
it, it's just um, it's just fear based. Um, I myself am not very religious, um, and there are a lot of people just like me who are born in the United States and who um, may have grown up in a Muslim household who have absolutely no interest in harming this country. And it's it's kind of a delusion to think that we are. We have some Facebook questions along the lines of your status. And since it's on the topic now, I'll just bring them up, okay? Okay. Okay, so the first one here is from Elena. She wants to know, uh, does Hakus Rath share Governor Bullock's opinion about SB 97 that would have banned consideration of foreign law in Montana courts? Yeah, it, well, I believe he vetoed it. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah, um, yeah, I think he, he was right to veto it. So the, the bill was designed to... Um, basically target a non-existent problem. It's saying you can't use Sharia law in our Montana courts. No one's using Sharia law in our Montana courts. And by trying to solve a non-existent problem, what it really does is create real problems. So are there places, though, in America where Sharia law has been used or in other countries where Sharia law has been co-opted into local law? Um, I'm not aware of anywhere in the United States that Sharia law is really being incorporated into our laws. But Dear- Dearborn, Michigan? I I don't know about Dur- okay. Dearborn, well, Michigan. Yeah, but that, that, that's in your that's in your in your wheelhouse. There, it's in the, in the Midwest. So. Well, okay. So here's the thing about well, his wheelhouse stretches to Georgia. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think we got a pretty good swath. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I'm no I'm no Sharia law expert. You know, I I've um, and I don't think uh, most of the people who call in and think they know about Sharia law are experts about it either. I mean, if I'm not an expert and I grew up in a Muslim household my whole life, I don't think the average Montana knows what they're talking about. Well, I've had a beard since Christmas, so I am an expert. <laughs> it looks um, good. I was going to say. Uh, another quick one. She said she wants to know what your relationship is with CARE, the Council on a, is American Islamic Relations. And I don't have a relationship with CARE. Have um, you they ever spam had me with emails sometimes, and I, they go to my junk mail folder. I don't, okay. I don't know. Now I have to jump in and remind some of these callers that, uh, you know, beyond all this question of Sharia, that Muslims themselves are the largest group of victims of radical Islamist groups. I mean, you look at the numbers of innocent Muslims who have been killed, whether it's in Pakistan or in Iraq or, you know, across the globe, you know, in Indonesia, so on and so forth, by acts of terrorism. And you look at the number of Westerners killed and you look at the number of Muslims, natives, who have been killed, maimed, beheaded, so on and so forth. This is not a problem of Islam versus the West. This is actually a problem of West and many millions of moderate Muslims against a very small group of radicalized, very violent Islamists. And that is why if we want to really solve this problem, we actually have to join forces with those moderate Muslims who are fighting this on a daily basis, rather than putting you know, 1.5 billion Muslims uh, into one bag and just dehumanize them as them, as the terrorists, as the dangerous ones. This is actually shooting ourselves in the foot. Okay. And with that, we'll take a one-minute timeout. Our time is rapidly running out. Eric and Jim are going to try to get your calls on. We'll be right back in one minute. Hey, we are back. On talk back and almost out of time, so I want to get as many calls in as we can. Uh, Eric, real quickly, uh, can you please state your, your, your comment and question, and then we'll try to get to the other caller on as quickly as possible. Go ahead. Yeah, I like the, uh, the other caller's analogy of the family arguing and then inviting somebody, and then your guest had a response to that. But the, 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 the response can be shot down quite easily. It's the, the folks in the house arguing amongst each other didn't create the problem that facilitated the hungry person outside their house. The U.S. government is perpetrating illegal wars or immoral wars all over the world. Uh, In fact, Mark Levin was on the radio the other day saying that Trump was justified in missling Syria because past U.N. resolutions had authorized it. And so you create a problem, and then you the, the agenda is multiculturalism. And this is why all these people are being brought over here. There's a multicultural agenda. These wars are facilitating that. Most of these people would probably rather stay at home and live out their lives in their homeland rather than coming over here. But anyway... Multicultural agenda. There's my comment. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the call. Uh, let's, let's, let's get Jim on real quick. Jim, good morning. You're on Talkback. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, this uh, assembly of our state uh, 
uh, government uh, is trying to push through that they can incorporate Sharia law into our state government. My other uh, uh, comment is is the um, is uh, you say they can't vote. Well, if they possess a driver's license in most states, they can vote. That's my comment. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, gentlemen, uh, we had a couple of comments there. So, if you want to respond to that, please go ahead, Anthony. Or well, I mean, as far as so. voting, I mean, you you don't just walk into a polling place with your driver's license and vote. You have to register, and you can't register if you're um, not a. Um, U.S. citizen, and mistakes have happened occasionally, but the idea that this is happening frequently is, is incorrect. Also, um, you can't get a driver's license in the state of Montana ever since 2005. You cannot get a driver's license in the state of Montana unless you prove your immigration status, and the DMVs have a system called SAVE. It's called the Systematic um, Alien Verifications for Entitlements Program, and they run you through that program, and uh, if you don't show up as somebody who has a valid status that allows them to be here, they don't issue a license. So you, there are no Montana licenses being issued to people without status. To the second caller's question about Sharia law, um, that is one of the things. Like, why oppose something if it's redundant? I get, yeah, we don't want extra paperwork floating around, but uh, if you've ever looked at local government or state government, there's lots of extra paperwork floating around. So why, why is it such a big deal if it's just redundant? You're talking about SB 97? Yeah. So the, the main problem with that bill is that it talked about um, it, you know, not utilizing any laws that are unconstitutional under the state of uh, un, under the Montana Constitution, and uh, I think that's already covered. I mean, you, you the Montana Constitution already wouldn't allow you to. So to, it's redundant, I mean, right? So, but the thing is, by, by putting like a, in a law sure. that is redundant, it actually calls into question a lot of contractual um, rights in various. It, it would actually create more problems than it, it does. Cause, uh, create any solution. So it basically, there were people who uh, were against it just because it created uncertainty in contractual relations in the state of Montana. Have, and it, we, it, yeah. A uh, quick question from Facebook. We have uh, three Chad, minutes. sorry, I missed this one earlier. Uh, going back to whether the president has the power and the authority to enact the executive order banning the immigration of whomever he chooses, you never really answered the question. I think he's talking to you, Anthony. Um, you said it's been debated since 1798. I have read where it states the president can specifically ban the immigration of certain people he chooses, but I have not read anything where it states the president cannot. Which is more correct? The president can specifically ban people, or the president ambiguously cannot ban people? Well, I'm, I'm grateful for Chad for following up. It sounds like one of my students, as I get to the end of the class, are like, <laughs> we're going to be tested on this. What's the right answer? <laughs> um, well, the president claims, and there is a... There is a, a, a there are two congressional acts at play. One says that the president can uh, bar the entry of anyone who he finds may be detrimental to the interests of the United States. And so Congress has authorized that, and that's the authority that he's exercising. And I think, I think all uh, immigration lawyers, constitutional lawyers who look at it, it, says that that provides some authority for him to do it as long as it's consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Congress has also passed another law, a later law, that said that no person shall receive any, no person shall be discriminated against in the issuance of an immigrant visa because of race, nationality, place or birth or place of residence. That's another thing Congress has said. So there are, um, there's a core of the executive order and the enforcement action and the immigration power generally, which really is unquestioned today, even if it was unquestioned, even if it was debated um, around the time of, of the framing. Um, the question that about 30 different cases pending in court uh, now will address are how those powers work out, whether the president, um, who thus far in, in uh, the early litigation never provided any proof of a threat, whether the president can establish um, with due deference from the judicial system uh, the kind of threat that justifies a broad travel ban and um, establish that that travel ban does not violate the constitutional due process and equality rights that these persons may hold. We have one minute. So, uh, Shahid, if you wouldn't mind, how can folks get in touch with you? Where do you practice? Do you practice here in Missoula or just in the state of Montana or what? Yeah, I um, I practice in Helena. In That's Helena. Where, okay. um, and um, as far as uh, the people who've been calling in, I would prefer they don't get in touch with me. But, <laughs> ac but actually, but other people who want immigration help... Um, yeah, they can always look me up at my website is bordercrossinglaw.com. Okay. And, um, you know, I, um, yeah, I uh, would be glad to, um, I have a blog on, on that website as well that talks okay. about some of my ideas. on Right. Immigration. And we have uh, the conference to talk about. Yeah. Right. So just uh, remind all the listeners that the conference starts uh, at noon today. 
uh, with a wonderful panel uh, by our young scholars. And then tonight, the uh, keynote by the two distinguished guests here at 7 o'clock at UC Theater, University Center Theater at University of Montana. And then tomorrow night at 7 again, Ambassador John Limbert. All right, we are done. Have a great day, everybody.